Those of you who have ever used a radial arm saw will probably be scratching your heads in bewilderment at the method used for cutting with the triton. Uh, a radial arm saw, as some of you will know, cuts with the back of the blade leading into the work. With the triton, it's the exact opposite. Radial arm type saw cut is a climb cut. We're doing a feed cut, and the feed cut is definitely the recommended method. However, there are some instances where you may want to use a climb cut. For example, a long piece of moulding, cornice or architrave, for example. As I mentioned earlier, you want your good face to be down to minimise splintering. Now, obviously, you can't rest this safely and securely on its good face down. Okay, so with a piece like this, you want to cut it with the good face up so it can rest securely on its flat back with the square side against your work stops. And uh, you want to do it as a climb cut so that you're not splintering this top face. The way to do it, very simply, pack out your work stops so that you can start off with your saw blade completely parked behind the work stops. Then you can slide your piece of wood in on its flat square base and cut with the back of the blade. A couple of very important points. Firstly, you must have a sharp saw blade, preferably tungsten carbide tipped. Secondly, the mechanism which locks your saw down must be very secure and firm Tighten the lever or tighten the wing nut very tightly. Thirdly, you must control the rate of feed of the saw because this is a climb cut called that way because the saw will tend to climb up on the work. And unless you're controlling it rigidly with a firm wrist and a firm elbow, uh, the saw will race towards you, biting off more than it can chew in effect, and it'll damage your blade, it'll damage your work, and certainly damage your confidence. So hold the wood against the work stops, packed out, uh, line up your cut, switch on, and slowly feed the saw towards yourself with a stiff wrist and elbow. As you can see, the upper face is perfect, unsplintered and sh shattered, and all the tearing is on the back face where it doesn't matter at all. As you'll probably realise, in a climb cut, the saw blade is cutting down onto the work and holding the work firmly against the table, rather than a feed cut where there is some tendency for the work to lift off the table. Now, you can use that to good advantage when cutting thin, flimsy pieces of, of uh, moulding or quad or whatever picture frame material. Uh, use the blade to hold the work down on the table. Mind you, of course, you can always cut those pieces in a table saw mode, but if they're very long and awkward and you happen to be in the cross-cut mode, you can do it as a climb cut. The 45-degree mitre cut, one of the most common cuts used in woodworking and certainly one of the most troublesome. There are many ways of cutting mitres, and the table saw mode is generally the first mode you should consider for cutting mitres. Uh, you'll see a bit more on that later on in this video. However, if you're cutting long pieces of moulding or architrave or cornice, then obviously you'll want to do it in the cross-cut mode where you don't have to move the wood, you can move the saw. Now, the Triton makes mitering very easy because you've got this excellent protractor which has two faces which are exactly at 90 degrees to each other and you'll see how valuable that is shortly. Talking about these faces, they are lined with sandpaper. This is so your workpiece won't slip on the painted surface as you're doing the cut because there is a significant tendency for the wood to creep along the face of the mitre gauge. That's why the sandpaper is there and will generally eliminate the need to use G-clamps to hold the work to the table or to the mitre fence. The sandpaper should provide enough grip. Now, you can lock the protractor anywhere that you like in this slot in the table, especially if you remove the two work, stop, work stops. You can lock it where you like to admit any width of timber that you want to cut. Let's just lock it off here, loosen the large T-knob, push it down, turn the locking head around and lock it in position. And then if you wish you can fine tune your angle setting, but this is set at 45 degrees, so let's do a test cut and see if it's right. Get yourself a piece of scrap and position it in the work centre so that you're creating quite a substantial offcut. You may want to trim that offcut again later on uh, if the angle setting isn't quite right, so make it big enough so that you can hold that offcut and do a cut on it later. Hold the wood firmly against the sandpaper face. Do a smooth, even cut. Don't push the saw in too fast. It's critical on a mitre cut. So just 
to a cut at 45 degrees. Clean any fibers off the pieces and lay them down on a flat surface and just check firstly, so there's a tiny little dag there, just check firstly that there is no gaping at that point. If you've got a chink of light showing through there, then obviously your saw blade angle is incorrect in relation to the table. Either you need to adjust your wing nut on the front of the saw or adjust your table slightly. But if that matches up perfectly, then you can turn your attention to the joint itself. And with this sitting touching neatly, I can take a tri-square and take a reading and see how it fits. Well, that's absolutely perfect. I hope you can see that. But that's an absolutely perfect 45 degree mitre joint because it's touching all the way along the joint and there's no light showing between the wood and the, and the tri-square. If that wasn't quite correct, then you'll have to make a very slight adjustment in the setting of the mitre gauge by loosening this knob here, the front one, and making a tiny adjustment setting. And I say tiny because what you've got here is an offcut being placed against the main piece. So if the gauge was set in error at say 44 and 3 quarter degrees, a quarter of a degree off, you're doubling that error because both of these pieces are 44 and 3 quarters. Twice 44 and 3 quarters is 89 and a half. A quarter of a degree of setting error will result in a half a degree of cutting error. So make minute adjustments and because you've left both of these pieces long enough to comfortably handle, after each adjustment, do a shaving cut on both pieces to make sure they're going to be, you're treating them the same way. The two faces of the gauge are at exactly 90 degrees to each other. They're perfectly square. So let's just set this up here. And let's imagine for a moment that we have an error, and let's introduce an error of one degree in the setting. I've deliberately set this now at 44 degrees. I'll put one piece in here and cut it. Just take a shaving cut off at 44. And I'll put my other piece against this face. Now, if that's 44, that must be 46 because they both add up to 90 exactly holding it even more firmly because now I'm pressing it, pulling it back towards myself. Thumb hooked over the mitre gauge, hold it firmly, again, just a shaving cut. And we can virtually guarantee you that any piece is cut, where one piece is cut on face A and one piece is cut on face B, they will always add up to a perfect 90 degree right angle. Guaranteed. You'll find it's very useful to attach wooden fence extenders to your mitre gauge and we of course provide the holes to enable you to do that. Now, when you're cutting a frame, say a rectangular frame or a square frame, it's very important to have all the opposite pieces exactly the same length. Instead of measuring and marking each piece and therefore running a risk of an error, and then trying to cut exactly the line each time, another chance of an error, uh, it's best to use a wooden fence extenders and a stop block. Stop block just like this, mitre cut on one end and cross cut on the other end. Now, important little point. This is too small to cut and hold. Obviously, your fingers would be too close to the blade. How do you do it? Well, cut a 45 degree mitre on a longer piece and then trim off the end, the waste piece, which you now want, the offcut becomes your, your clamping block, which you can then clamp to the subfence, make sure it's nice and square, clamp it on like so, adjust it if necessary. Then you take all of your long pieces, cut the first cut on face A of the protractor, like so. Again, try to set face A at 45 degrees as close as you can, but it's not essential that you be spot on. Having cut face A, you can butt the piece you just cut into the stop block and then cut face B. Okay. 
Remove the offcut when the blade stops spinning, pull the saw back, and there you have the complementary reverse angle, and every piece cut in this way against that stop will be exactly the same length. Just before leaving mitre cutting for the moment, there's a couple of joints I'd like to show you. Firstly, the halved crossover joint. Very strong and very useful if you're building gates or fences or verandas, for example. What you have to do is cut your pieces to length and cut them so they fit into the frame you're building. Then mark them in position, pencil mark there and there, and on the back of the other piece there and there. And then you can put the two pieces into the work centre with the pencil marks lined up exactly. And here's another hint too, if you're working with very long heavy pieces, then don't try to rest them against the Triton's protractor, it's not quite long enough. Use the protractor to set a straight piece of wood at the required angle, normally 45 degrees. Either clamp the wood to the table in the correct position or screw it to the protractor. And then with your blade raised for a half cut only, you can make a series of cuts through there, moving the wood sideways after each cut. Again, it'll help you if you tape the pieces together. The half lap mitre joint. An extremely attractive joint because it's mitered from the front, and yet it's also very strong because the two pieces are halved in together. Here's how it's done. Beware, the two halves of each joint are not the same, so don't fall into the trap of making them all the same. Take one piece of each joint and raise the saw blade so it's just cutting halfway through the work. And then with the piece resting against face A of the mitre gauge, face A is set exactly at 45 degrees to the saw blade, make a series of cuts, removing the waste, like so, of this small triangular piece here. Then take the other piece of each joint and place it against the work stop, square to the blade. Again, with the blade raised for a half cut, make a series of cuts until you've removed half of the piece of wood to the end. And then all you have to do is set the blade down to its full depth of cut and with the wood against the mitre gauge, remove the small triangle of half material still connecting. A bevel cut is where you angle the saw blade to the table, and it means you can achieve an angled cut across a wide piece of wood, 18 inches, 450 millimetres, or even wider if you've got a smaller saw. Here's how you do it. Before disturbing your carefully found zero position on your power saw, take a scriber and make a scratch mark on a part of the saw to show you where true zero is, because you'll need to find that position again when you go back to normal cross-cutting. Having found true zero, loosen off the saw blade adjusting mechanism and raise the blade very slightly. Just lift the teeth out of the saw blade slot, otherwise I'll kiss against the edge of the slot, and set the saw at what the saw says is 45 degrees and lock it in position there with the blade now fully lowered. You may find, depending on the saw you have, that this safety guard will flip open at this point, so simply take a piece of tape and tape it in position. Okay, now you'll find, having done that, that the saw blade no longer reaches a table because it comes up in an arc out of the slot. Do not raise your table. Guaranteed recipe for disaster. Rather, put some packing on the table underneath the workpiece to offer the workpiece up the blade. The amount of packing you'll need will depend on the power saw you're using. In this case, a piece of 19mm particle board isn't quite enough, so I'll put a piece of hardboard underneath that again and that should raise me up high enough. Bear in mind, you will be cutting into this board. It's a sacrificial board. Then put your workpiece in. Just check that your saw teeth actually turn around. The saw blade turns around when you're running onto the sacrificial board. That feels fine. Now you can put your workpiece in position and do the cut shortly. Another thing you should check too, when you're at 45 degrees or your selected angle, do a complete dummy run and make absolutely certain that your saw blade can't hit the notched work stop. This notch in the left hand work stop is to admit the saw blade when it's angled. Now most saw blades will sail through that notch at 45 degrees, but at shallower angles you should always check to make sure the saw blade is not going to hit metal. That's why you do, you do the dummy run. One important point though. A bevel cut will put an enormous amount of load on the power saw itself. The saw's got enough to cope with without you twisting the hand grip of the saw as you do the cut. So here it's very important to switch off the power, lock the trigger of the saw on, make sure everything's nice and tight, the saw's fully clamped down,
wing nuts, everything tight, and then you can do the cut holding the wood quite firmly because there is a tendency for the wood to move sideways during this cut. So hold it firmly or consider clamping it in position. Use a locked on trigger technique and switch on and make the cut. Now, if you didn't move that sacrificial board, you'll find you've now got a score line in it, and that was made by the tips of the blade teeth. If you were to clamp that board in position now, then you'd find that the saw blade will always pass through that line and give you an excellent sighting point for future cuts. The piece of particle board which I just cut is very free cutting material. Now get yourself something a little bit harder, softwood will still do, and get a couple of fairly lengthy pieces long enough to hold comfortably. Now, a bevel cut puts an enormous amount of load on the power saw. Uh, so you must have a sharp blade and don't feed too quickly. Also, because of the incredible load on the saw, uh, we do strongly recommend the locked on tri trigger technique is used. So switch off the power and lock the saw trigger on. Because almost certainly in pushing the saw, you would twist it slightly if you held onto the hand grip. Also, there is a tendency for the wood to move so hold the wood down firmly, or perhaps even consider clamping at the table. Another option is to put a sandpaper face on the work stops to hold the wood more, more firmly. You'll see a bit more on that in a few moments. Hold the wood firmly, hold the two pieces together, lock your fingers around them, position the saw, line it up. You've already done a dummy run to make sure you can't cut through the metal work stops. And then position it, switch on the power and make your cut. If on a bevel cut you get a bit of a burn mark on the wood or a slight step, which I haven't got here because I've got a nice sharp blade, but if you do get some ridging or a burn mark or a step, it's very, very simple to just make your cut, pull the saw back, clear the off cuts from the table, and then inch the wood very slightly that way towards the saw blade, very slightly, and make a shaving cut, just a finishing cut like this. I'll just show you, even though I haven't got a burn mark to get rid of, I'll just show you the principle of a finishing cut. As you can see, I'm removing less than one blade thickness. Now, the less you can remove with a skimming cut, the better, because obviously, if that blade cuts three millimeters on a normal cut, if you're only taking one millimeter off, then the blade's working one third as hard as it was previously, blade and saw and so on. So do shaving cuts to get a perfectly smooth, perfect bevel. Once you've done your finishing cuts and you're happy with them, then you can arrange the pieces. Uh, you can actually use the aluminium bearing channels of the Triton and the work stop to give you a right angle and check that they're exactly square, touching all the way when they're in a right angle or use a normal tri-square. Once you're happy with your true 45 position, take your scriber again and make yourself a little mark at true 45 for future reference on your saw. Alternatively, you saw earlier how we recommended that, that you make this saw blade height setting block with a couple of rulers on it. Well, the same block could just as easily have a bevel cut side. So you can use that sitting in here against the work stops and use that as a setting block to get your saw blade angle absolutely correct. You will have noticed during your experimental bevel cuts that it's very difficult to sight up exactly where you're going to cut. Well, there's an easy way around that problem too. And that is to make up a permanent little bevel ripping platform like this. It's basically a piece of particle board and because of the saw I'm using, I've had to put some masonite as well or hardboard underneath that as well. It's got two cleats there and there. Now they are spaced so that this sits snugly on the Triton table and that's very important, you'll see in a moment why. And finally, it's got a vertical fence to rest your work against, and that's got sandpaper glued on it to stop the wood creeping during the cut. This is how it works. You slide this on like so. It drops on, and the cleats make it impossible for this to move sideways. It's now firmly on the Triton table. 
Okay, the very first cut you make, you'll make a score line along here and a 45 degree cut through there. So make sure before you do this that your saw is cutting exactly 45 degrees. You can either mark your desired distance on the bevel, like so, or you can just put a tiny little mark on the end of, on the wide face of the material, because you can use either or both of the notches, whichever you prefer. This is how you line up on the bevel, by just touching the pencil line at the edge of the score mark, or if you want to use a notch in the fence there, that's how you line it up, and you'll cut exactly to your line each time. Bevel cuts are most commonly used for making square or rectangular frames. Now with a square frame, you want all four pieces to be exactly the same length. With a rectangular frame, you want the top and the bottom the same length, and the two sides the same length. Okay, the idea is, don't measure and mark each piece separately, cut them simultaneously. Very simply, trim all the ends of your pieces to length, get a nice bevel cut on them, do a shaving cut if necessary, then turn the pieces around, Get the bevel cut ends dead in line, run your finger along them two or four pieces simultaneously, then move both of them in together, like so, tape together if you wish, and then make a cut, and those two pieces will be exactly the same length, or four pieces if that's what you're doing. A 45 degree bevel joint, while it's very attractive, isn't terribly strong. You've basically just got the glue to hold that from opening up. Now, you can of course dowel that joint, but that's quite a tricky operation. There is a simpler way, and that's to cut a spline groove or a keyway. And you do that very simply like this, cutting the groove with the two pieces in the open position and then cutting a piece of plywood, contrasting colour or the same colour, to fit in there and lock that joint together beautifully. And that of course gives you much greater gluing area and because the piece of plywood, the tongue, is in tension, it makes it very, very strong. Just a quick point about spline grooves before I show you how to make them. Uh, while it's desirable, I guess, for aesthetic reasons, to have the groove central on the bevel, it's not essential. As you can see from this example, that keyway is well closer to this corner than it is to there. But as long as you do the two pieces together, they'll always match up perfectly. Here's how. Again, do your pieces two at a time, and perhaps mark the halfway point on the bevel on one of the pieces with a pen or a pencil. Place it into the work centre, line up the pencil mark you've made with the 45 degree sighting notch. There you go, lined up central in the notch. Line the two pieces up together. Now here's a very important step. Raise the saw blade, otherwise you'll cut all the way through your beautifully cut bevel. So raise your saw blade, you don't have to raise it very far, but raise it a fraction. Again, trial and error is a good idea here. Hold the pieces firmly, you may have to clamp them in position but you should be able to hold them, especially if you've got sandpaper on the face of your fence. Switch on and make a cut. And because those two pieces were cut simultaneously, then they must add up to a perfect slot when you put them together. If you don't want to use plywood for the key or the tongue, then later on in the table saw mode, we'll show you how you can rip yourself a narrow strip of the same sort of material so that you can make a concealed spline bevel joint. There will be some occasions, for example, when you're building a hip roof, where you need to cut a compound mitre, also known as a bevel mitre or a compound cut or a creeper cut. And that's where you're angling the wood and you're angling the saw blade simultaneously to get this splayed effect. To cut the bevel mitre, remove both of your work stops, lock the mitre gauge in its slot, and determine the angle you want to cut at. In this case, I've chosen 22 and a half degrees. Then adjust your saw blade angle to the other angle that you want on the compound cut, also 22 and a half degrees in this case. Then put a piece of packing, sacrificial board, down on your tabletop because you will be cutting into that board and you certainly don't want to cut into your tabletop. Put it down and clamp it in position to the table. I'll explain the clamp in a moment. Hold the piece of wood firmly against the sandpaper face of the mitre gauge and make the cut. 
There's the bevel mitre. Now, the reason for the G-clamp holding that sacrificial board in the spot is that that score line there is where your blade passes. So in future, when you want to cut to a pencil mark, you simply mark your piece of wood where you want to cut it, place it right above the, the little score line, and away you go, you can cut accurately to that mark. You can get some really spectacular results on a piece of straight wood by making a series of evenly spaced cuts in it so that you can then bend the piece of wood into a perfect right angle or an arch as in the case here. Now, it's called kerfing and it derives its name from the fact that each of those cuts is called a kerf, the saw kerf. Before I show you how it's done, a few principles. Firstly, for this to be neat, each of the cuts has to be equally spaced, the same distance apart from the other. That's quite easy to achieve. But now have a close look and you'll notice that the bottom piece, the cuts are further apart now than the top piece. As a result, the top piece bends into a very tight little radius and this piece where the cuts are further apart is a much more gentle radius. So the distance apart controls the tightness of radius of the bend. Another principle is that for a given saw blade, if you don't change your saw blade and you don't change the thickness of material you're cutting, then the same number of cuts will give you a right angle no matter how far or close together they are apart. For example, if this is inch and a half thick material, then 14 cuts with this saw blade will give me a perfect right angle. If they're very close together or very far apart, they'll still give me a perfect right angle. And you'll have to do some trial and error experimentation to get that into a perfect right angle. A little hint, a cheating hint if you will, is that if you find that 14 cuts gives you a little bit less than a right angle and 15 gives you more than a right angle, what you can do is effectively have 14 and a half cuts. How do you do that? Well, you cheat. The first and last cut, make them very slightly wider. Do a cut and then a shaving cut, a cut and a shaving cut, and you've basically got, then got 14 and a half cuts without it looking obvious. You can, by taking it even further, if 14 cuts give you a right angle, then 4 times 14 will give you 360 degrees, uh, or twice 14 will give you 180 degrees. So you can experiment with kerfing and make any shape or size you want, provided it's curved. The next question you have to address is how much material to leave uncut. Now this is very much a matter for trial and error. Uh, leave too much uncut and it'll break as you bend it. Leave too little uncut and you won't have terribly much strength in the, in the curve. So you have to play around with that and it does depend very much on the moisture content of the material, but I'll talk further about material later. Trial and error would suggest that anywhere between two and four millimeters of uncut material is what you should allow and so raise your saw blade the appropriate amount and always with kerfing, always test on some scrap because there's nothing more frustrating than to have selected a perfect length of material for a job and then find that you've done all the kerfing and then it breaks when you're actually bending it into shape. So, take an off cut of the material you'll be using, raise the saw blade by an arbitrary amount. I'll just look down here and raise it by, say, two millimeters or so. Now here it's very important to use a locked on trigger technique because you can move the saw up and down very slightly if you push a little heavily on the saw hand trigger. So switch off the power and lock on the trigger. Now select an off cut where at least one face, the face which is going to do the bending, is free of imperfections and has long straight grain and have that good face downwards. Put it in the machine. It's also essential that you have two work packers uh, on, the, on the work stops and I've made a pencil mark on this one uh, a short distance away from my sighting notch. Now that pencil mark, the distance between that and the notch will give me my spacing. Of course you can change that by rubbing out the pencil mark and putting a new one on wherever you want it. Basically what you do is you make a cut wherever you like, say about halfway across the piece with the saw blade raised. Lock the trigger on, 
just stopped at 14 cuts there. Oh, it's clearly not enough. That's not a right angle. Another couple of cuts and I'll be right. Put it back in. Line up the last cut you just made with the pencil mark and then make the next cut and so on. Just keep lining up the cut you just made with the pencil mark and that gives you perfectly even spacing. As you can see, I've cut this piece almost all the way through and there's very little uh, material left, so it's very easy to bend this one. Uh, it's also not that strong. But um, if you leave a thicker amount connecting, then take a good deal of care in bending it. In fact, flex a little way and leave it sit there. Tie it in position if you wish. Bend it a bit more, tie it in that new position. Bend it a bit more and tie it in the final position. Give the wood fibers a chance to accustom themselves to their new configuration and new shape. If you've left quite a bit of material connecting, then you may want to experiment by getting the kettle out in the workshop and playing some steam on the face which is going to be bending. You can also try some hot water on that face, but do not immerse the whole thing in water because it'll all swell up and you'll ruin the piece. These two examples of kerfing show dramatically the difference in radius with the different spacing of cuts. But uh, I mentioned a moment ago the uh, idea of tying the wood into position so that the wood fibers can get a chance to accustom themselves to a new shape. Well, it's, you can tie it or you can make up on a piece of particle board uh, some little blocks or corners or use L-shaped corner block pieces like this to lock your curved piece into its new position or in stages getting up to its new position and leave it there to get used to the new spot or in fact for the glue to dry. Now, when it comes to gluing it, you can just glue the inside of each curved piece and allow the glue to hold on the very corners there, the very edges, and that's reasonably strong. If you want some real strength in it, then you've got to put some filler in. Uh, you can mix up your own filler using sawdust and uh, PVA glue, clear colorless glue, or indeed you can use a tinted filler, uh, black or red or brown or whatever color you need. Car body filler can be used quite effectively and even some construction adhesives, like liquid nails, for example, they can be used quite effectively for gluing up and getting a lot of strength back into kerfing. Well, you may be excused for wondering just what you use kerfing for. A number of uses, surprisingly. Firstly, you can use it for decorative effect. If you'd built a bar and you had these all along the front of it, nicely stained and glued on, that'd look very unusual and unique. Secondly, if you make it strongly enough, you can use kerfing for a banister, a handrail for a set of stairs, for example. You'd have fewer cuts so that this, this part rises at the angle of your staircase. That's one use for kerfing. Or you could make an armchair where uh, that's your armrest and that becomes your leg. Very interesting application. One thing I've just recently made is this coffee table. All fully kerfed with a glass top, smoky glass top. And as you can see, it's curved for the top, and the legs are also curved. So the limit is your own ingenuity. Play around with it. You'll get a lot of satisfaction out of curfing and a lot of frustration. You'll break a few pieces, but persist with it, be patient, and you can get some really amazing results which your neighbors and friends just won't believe that you have done. There are a number of materials which are suitable, and you can even curve hardwood. Don't be afraid to try it on hardwood, as long as the moisture content is fairly high. Avoid material that's been sitting in a dry, air-conditioned or heated environment, preferably something that's been stored outdoors in an area where there's quite a lot of moisture content in the air. Now, materials you can try in Australia include things like silver ash, myrtle beech, spotted gum, celery top pine, king billy pine. They all work very well. If you can't get hold of any of these materials, consult your local timber merchant. He may be able to help you. But definitely look for material which is long and straight-grained and has very few defects or imperfections. Good luck. All of the cuts you've seen so far have been made in the cross-cut mode. And as you know, there are several other modes of operation of the Triton Work Center. And I'm about to show you how to do a conversion from the cross-cut mode to table saw mode. It only takes about 30 seconds. And we'd really like to encourage you to use the different modes whenever appropriate, rather than struggling in the inappropriate mode it may, may be much easier just to change the machine over. It's as easy as this. Switch off the power. Lock the trigger of the saw on. Fit the trigger strap. Then slide the saw towards the rear panel 
and lift two of the bearings up out of the, out of the bearing channels. Then your blade is out of the slot in the table. You can unlock the two locking keys, pull the table forwards and out sideways, and just rest it down on the floor there. Then disconnect the power and reroute it through here. And now you can complete your inversion of the saw, turn it upside down. You may have to blow sawdust out of the channels. There you go. And centralize your saw with the marks you've made. Turn the table around, put it back on top, and that should neatly lock in position, and you put the keys into the holes labeled R. Then you can remove the work stops. Always double check that the saw chassis is firmly locked by the tab underneath the table. And then fit the safety guard and riving knife as close as you can behind the blade, about a half an inch or 12 millimeters behind the blade, and lock that in position. Now the rip fence. It goes in here, the high side of the fence closest to the blade. Drop it in, turn the feet through 90 degrees, and almost lock them up. Still free to adjust and slide, but easy to tighten. And then the miter gauge fits in this slot, and you're ready to go as a table saw. When converting back from the table saw mode to the cross-cut mode, there's a couple of very important points to consider. Firstly, clear off the table and remove the table and put it to one side. Then pull the saw towards yourself and flip it over like so. That way you don't tangle in the power cord. Rest those two bearings on top of the channels for the moment. Turn the table around so the T-shaped holes are closest to the rear panel and then slide the table into position and lock it in. Now, two important points. Firstly, don't forget to put these bearings back in their channels. Otherwise, when you finish a cut, you drop down and perhaps damage your blade and damage your triton table. Now, the other point is the power cord. As you can see, by converting this way, the power cord is now between the channel and the table and that eliminates the need for unplugging and replugging, and you may be tempted to do it, do it this way. However, there's a problem. The power cord can become snagged in that corner there and could either impede your cut or under certain circumstances could back up on the table like so and you might conceivably recut the power cord with a spinning saw blade. So it is best to unplug and route the power cord out beyond the front of the machine and into the plug. The table saw is probably the most versatile and useful piece of equipment you're ever likely to use in your workshop. However, it's also the piece of equipment that probably causes the most number of accidents and injuries of any, perhaps because of its wider use, or perhaps because the saw blade is exposed and people become complacent and end up hurting themselves. Now, you can use a table saw very, very safely if you follow some rules and follow them all the time. Firstly, always keep your fingers clear, clear of the blade. Take your piece of wood and rehearse the cut. Determine where your fingers are going to pass and make sure you've always got the safety guard fitted and lowered so that only the wood can pass through. Now when you're through ripping, when you're ripping all the way through a piece of wood, you must have the riving knife fitted and the safety guard. It must be on every time you're cutting all the way through. There are certain other cuts where you don't have to have the riving knife and safety guard, but we'll get to those later. For through ripping, always have them on. Never reach behind or over a spinning saw blade. That's a very large cause of accidents. People do the cut quite effortlessly and then carelessly reach beside or behind the blade to clear a scrap off the table. Don't. Have a stick handy and use that to flick the scraps off the table or switch off the power, wait till the blade stops spinning and then take the scraps and uh, remove them from the tabletop. Whenever you're ripping a piece of wood, and especially when there's a narrow piece between the blade and the fence, always use a push stick to push that wood through behind the back of the blade. Just remember one thing, wood grows again, fingers don't. We'll show you later on in this video some other jigs and fixtures and push sticks which will make your work easy and safe. Never attempt a freehand rip.
By that I mean, don't ever try to rip to a pencil line just feeding the wood through by hand. You must use the fence or the protractor to guide the workpiece past the blade. Because look what would happen if you were doing a feed cut by hand following a pencil line. If the wood skewed only slightly, it would jam on the blade and the blade would kick the wood back towards you at a terrifying rate and possibly cause an accident. So, always use a fence or the protractor to guide the work. Talking about the fence, the fence must always be set absolutely parallel to the saw blade. You can rip papers on the Triton, you certainly don't do it by angling the fence in towards the blade. That's an extremely dangerous situation. Bear in mind at all times when you're setting the fence, the reading in both windows must be the same. And as a very important point, if you've set the front window first, and then you've set the rear window to suit, always go back and check the front window again. You'll find it's probably moved very slightly in setting the back. So lock it off exactly parallel, and then you can feed your work through. Having said that, you may find some circumstances where you'll want to have a slightly higher reading in the rear window than in the front. And I mean slightly, no more than one millimeter or a little over a 32nd of an inch. And you can give yourself some relief or escape at the back. And you do that when you're cutting green timber, which tends to bind on the saw blade, or very badly dressed material, or if for any other reason you find the workpiece is jamming very slightly between the fence and the riving knife. You can give yourself about a millimeter of escape in setting the fence. Otherwise, absolutely parallel front and rear. One last point about fence setting. Every time you've set the fence to a new position, double check that it's properly locked at both ends. Make sure the fence is securely locked down. Never feed from the back of the blade. The riving knife normally prevents you from doing that anyway, but the sort of people who attempt to rip from the back of the blade often don't use a riving knife. So, let me show you what happens if you are foolish enough to attempt this. The saw blade is spinning around that way. If you feed onto the back of the blade, the blade will lift the wood and rip it out of your hands at an incredible rate and could cause serious injury. So never feed from the back of the blade. You must always feed from the front of the blade so the teeth are cutting down onto the wood, pressing the wood firmly against the table. Never switch on the power to your saw while there is anything touching the blade, like a piece of wood. And never switch on the saw when there's a danger of something lying on the table, a scrap or a tri-square or a pencil vibrating in towards the blade. If during the course of a cut you run into a problem, do not pull the workpiece out with the blade still spinning. This is what you do. Wait until the blade stops spinning, and then when it's come to a complete halt, you can pull the workpiece out. Let's say you've got a piece of wood like this, and you want to rip this much off it. Now you've got two choices, of course. You can set the fence in very close to the blade, like so, and take off this narrow strip, the narrow strip ending up between the blade and the fence. But that is the wrong way of doing it, for the reason just mentioned a little while ago, that you'll have a narrow, thin, spear-like piece trapped between the spinning blade and the fence. And of course, as soon as you finish that cut, as soon as you get to this point here, that small piece will go spearing out backwards very quickly. For that reason, also, get into the habit now of never standing directly in line with the blade. Always stand to one side or the other. But more importantly, avoid situations where you're going to have a narrow off-cut trapped between the blade and the fence. Do it this way. Turn the wood around, set the fence to the wider dimension, and have the narrow piece fall harmlessly aside on this side of the blade. Uh, I've set the fence at the wide dimension so that the wider part of the piece is going to be between the blade and the fence. There's plenty of room in there for my fingers to get through so I can keep good hand control. I don't have to use a push stick. Hands are better than a push stick. You get better control when it's safe to do so. I'm going to keep my fingers very well tucked in, no fingers trailing at the back end. That's a very common cause of injury, fingers trailing behind there. I've already checked that this is a nice straight face that I'm running against the fence. It's very important that the face which runs against the fence is straight. The blade is square to the table, the safety guard is fitted and lowered so the wood can just pass through. Ready to go. Switch on. Switch on.
you'll notice I continued pushing the piece of wood until it was well clear of the blade and then when the blade was slowing down you can easily pick up the off cut and put it aside. Now let's just check that cut. Always work from the face which was resting on the triton table and check it with a square all the way along. Now I can see intermittently little chinks of light showing through there. It is very difficult to get a perfect rip cut first time. A few tips coming up on that. But one of the important reasons that I've wandered off square in this is that, can you see how this piece of wood is twisted? Wood is very rarely straight and of course the cut will reflect whatever twist there is in the piece of wood. So obviously try to select a straight, straight material as you can because it will affect the quality of your cuts. There are several other ways of achieving the same result though. Firstly, work with the appropriate saw blade. Now I've changed from the cross cutting blade, which had 60 teeth, to a coarser rip saw blade. Now the coarser blade gives you uh, a higher feed rate, if you wish, uh, because the teeth, the gullets behind each teeth can cope with the amount of sawdust being created. A finer tooth blade can be used in a table saw mode, but of course you have to feed the wood a little more slowly. So you'll have to experiment with your feed rate to make sure that it is appropriate for the blade you've got fitted. Feeding the wood too slowly can be bad as well because you might burn it. Uh, so you just have to experiment and get the right feel for it. I can't really tell you how to do it. You've got to find it out for yourself. But a few things that you can learn now. Work with a lowered saw blade. Now in this piece of four by two, uh, the saw blade's only just cutting through it. But imagine I was cutting a thin, narrow piece like this. Okay. The best way of doing that is to lower the saw blade until the blade teeth are just showing through the material. That's not only safer, of course, the less blade that's visible, the less chance there is of an accident, but it also gives you a much smoother cut with less ridging and splintering because the angle of approach of the teeth is much shallower than if they're cutting down from directly above. So lower the saw blade until the teeth are just protruding above the material being cut. Secondly, don't pause or stop during a cut if you can help it. Keep going in one smooth, uninterrupted motion. Any, every time you pause or stop, you'll get a very slight step in the cut. Avoid that if possible. Thirdly, do a finishing cut if you can. In other words, let's say you wanted this piece to be 70 millimeters wide when you're finished. Well, rip it to 71 mil first, then set your fence in at exactly 70 and do a finishing cut, very much like the shaving cuts that you were doing in the cross cut mode. Just reset the fence, say a millimeter, always double check the, the back setting, say a millimeter narrower than it was previously, and just do a shaving cut like this. Whoops, blade has to come back up again. Now, <clears throat> if in that finishing cut I was taking one millimetre off and my saw blade normally cuts three millimetres, then the blade and the saw are only working one third as hard as they were previously. And the finished result should be much smoother, squarer, and, and generally a better rip cut. When you're ripping a very long piece of wood, you must be mindful of the fact that you need good support before, during, and after the cut. Let me show you what would happen if you tried to rip a long piece of pine like this without good tail-out support especially. Lead-in support you can normally manage by supporting the piece of wood like this, with one hand back and one forward, but tail-out is a problem. See, as I feed this through, progressively, as the cut end hangs over the end of the machine, it becomes more and more difficult for me to support this piece, and eventually I start, it starts lifting, jamming against the saw blade, putting me in a very dangerous position where I'm leaning and I could easily overbalance and the wood will drop like that. So always have tail out support, that is if you can't have a friend to help you. If you are working on your own and you want to rip a long piece down, then there's a couple of ways you can do it. Firstly, the best way is to have the Triton extension table, 
and then as you feed the piece of wood through you've got something to catch it at the other end and you can continue through with no problems. If you don't have the Triton extension table, you may recall the trestle we made up in the crosscut mode to support long beams. Well, it's just as useful in the, in the table saw mode for supporting a long piece being ripped. And of course, you just simply feed the material through and the trestle acts as a catcher for you to support the long, heavy offcut. If you haven't got the Triton extension table and you can't be bothered building the trestle and you don't have a friend to help you, you can still cope with long beams, but this is not really recommended. I'll show you how to do it. It'll involve starting off the cut working from the front of the machine, then towards the end of the cut, work, walking around towards the back of the machine and pulling the work through. You will probably end up with a step in the cut, but at least you'll have done the cut. Uh, very importantly, when you pull the work through, do not jam the two pieces together. They could bind on the back of the blade and cause further problems. So just grab the main piece that you're pushing through, as you'll see. It is important when doing this cut to try to keep the material moving at a steady rate all the way through. Pauses and stops will give you a step in the cut, but in this, this time I got off lucky and it's quite a smooth cut. <laughs> 